Good evening and welcome once again to the Tzemach Bible Institute program. I'm John Klein and with me tonight as usual is Ken Garrison, pastor of Fellowship Church and founder of the Tzemach Bible Institute. Good evening, Ken. Good evening, John. Ken is the beast of Revelation 13, the one that was wounded in the head and then came back to life. Is that a uh, man or what is that? Well, John, there's all kinds of speculation about what this is really referring to. Uh, uh, I've, uh, uh, in, past, in the past, uh, I've read uh, uh, a lot of writers that thought it was like someone like John Kennedy, who was a world leader who got shot in the head and somehow was preserved somewhere and brought, brought back to life and became the Antichrist or something. Uh, I think that is not what John was referring to. I think he had a different vision in mind. Uh, when he was talking about this. So, uh, okay, so then uh, there's much speculation about the beast, uh, uh, the, the, uh, and we know from, and we've talked about it on this program, a beast is an empire or a government, a kingdom. Uh, so it's not necessarily referring to a man that came back to life. Uh, uh, so... We're, we're going to show then on tonight's program that uh, uh, biblically describe what the beast is and talk about the beast, the two beasts in Revelation 13. Okay, um, uh, let me add that um, uh, generally a beast is specifically defined in the Bible as a kingdom or a king or kingdoms. And I think a better word for our understanding today would be empower. Uh, an empire is when a, a nation that expands beyond its own borders to encompass other nations in an economic system and, and that system then being enforced by its military. So we can see throughout the ages uh, uh, empires and, and these, these things are seen by God from biblical revelation standpoint as very, very negative and evil and hence the uh, connotation of a beast. beast, and they always make war against the saints. So one, that, one, Daniel, one of the characteristics, one of the characteristics. Daniel writes about it, and in in uh, Daniel seven, and John writes about right. it. Right now, so, uh, let, let's let's go. Where uh, John said a minute ago, we in previous programs have looked at uh, the beast described in Daniel seven specifically. Uh, now we're going to follow that up with the uh, so-called beast of Revelation 13 and, and the, following, the last half, really, of the book of Revelation. And here John describes uh, a beast coming up out of the water uh, with seven heads. One of the heads have a fatal wound, uh, and, but that wound is healed. And so that's, what, that's where all of these questions arise from. Uh, John, if you would, read that uh, excerpt from uh, Revelation 13. All right. Uh, I'm reading, going to read verses 1 to 3. And he stood on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on, uh, on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beach, beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Well, that, that should be sufficiently confusing enough for everyone. Uh, now, uh, fortunately, uh, John continues to give us considerable interpretation. And when we correlate this vision with what we've talked about before from Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, then I believe that we can come to some sense of what it means. Now, we've talked about the beast as an empire and that being evil uh, from God's perspective. Uh, one of the characteristics of this final conflict that we see prophesied in the earth, uh, two, two primary characteristics that all of these things share. Number one is that this becomes a global beast, that is, dominating all the nations of the world. And the second one, second characteristic, is that it's always making war with the saints. In other words, 
whatever the whatever we can understand to be the stated will of God, uh, this this beast is going to be warring against it. Uh, John, if you would uh, follow that up with uh, uh, what John wrote in thirteen seven. Uh, that specifically states that, if you would. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe, people, and tongue, and nation was given to him. Okay, so he makes war with the saints. And today we would consider that specifically to, uh, especially to mean Israel, opposition to Israel. Uh, and it would be opposition to uh, believers in Messiah Jesus, who uh, who relate to Israel or who have the same basic faith view biblically uh, of Israel and of their role in the world. Yeah, because in Daniel 7, he makes war with the saints there. Uh, obviously, that would be the nation of Israel. And here we see making war with the saints. That would be believers. Absolutely. Now, uh, again, Daniel. For, fortunately, John gives us some reasonable degree of interpretation so that we can understand what the otherwise would be a pretty opaque picture. And so we begin to see that in Revelation chapter 17. 17 is an interpretation. And so we see there that the beast actually represents uh, uh, seven specific efforts at global empire. And so, John, if you would, read again chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. And uh, uh, John, uh, John, the writer, now is going to then describe that. And they are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. And the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and one of the seven, and he does, goes to destruction. Well, that sounds opaque again, John. <laughs> okay, unless you write it out, Ken, then you could see it. Uh, then it's easier to understand. Unless That's correct. Right. So, so we have a chart right. then that, that look. Now, uh, the key to this thing, I think, is that John's, uh, John the writer, I'm going to confuse John the writer of the book of Revelation and John my partner. Uh, John the writer of the book of Revelation uh, specific, specifically says one kingdom or one empire is, and obviously the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, the, the Roman Empire is at the very apex of its power. So we would identify Rome as the one that is. Right. Uh, uh, so, effort in empire. So Rome would be six. That, that should be fairly easy. But that's easy. Now, so five have preceded it and one follows it. Right. And so if we look at our chart of possible world empires, then we have, uh, we'll just work on number six, Rome, and if we work our way backward, then we get Greece, Persia, Babylon, and Assyria. All of these are biblical and, and fairly easily established biblically. Now, to go back to this first one, uh, it's kind of difficult, but we believe that we're probably talking about Nimrod's Babel from uh, Genesis chapter 11, because that's one that God expressly struck and it was thought to be dead. And that was certainly a world empire. Everyone alive really was uh, involved uh, in that uh, empire, and uh, so God judged it. That's right. And evidently, that's the case. And so, and so on that chart, then we see that there's one post-Roman uh, empire, right. uh, yeah. regional, and by the way, we believe that the the ten horns or diadems that John read about from uh, Revelation 13, 1, 2, and 3 uh, actually pertains to that one uh, post-Roman effort at global empire, uh, which constitutes a number of empires actually over a period right, of time. Right, sequentially. Now, if we look back at uh, this uh, diagram, we sa it says that there's one yet to come, so that's the seventh. That's what I read. So now we have seven. One of those seven becomes the eighth. That's the one that seemed to be uh, wounded in the head and comes back to life. It's a, and, and we would say that's Nimrod's Babel comes back and becomes the eighth. It says the final Antichrist government there, but it is a revived Babel in that respect. And, uh, or a, as you put it, Ken, uh, which is easier for us to understand today, a one-world global government. And, and by the way, the reason that we would believe that it, it was Nimrod's Babel, because 
the Assyrians were overrun by the Babylonians, the Babylonians by the Persians, the Persians by the Greeks, the Greeks by the Romans. In other words, uh, each of these subsequent kingdoms was pretty much, their demise was pretty much similar to the others, with the exception of Nimrod's Babel. There we have a biblical account of God specifically striking it. Right. And so hence the idea, and it, as John pointed out, was uh, rule all of mankind. The beginning of Babel was Nimrod's uh, kingdom and so on, the Bible tells us. So, so uh, we suspect that that's what that first head is really pointing to, one that thought to be dead, but it's going to come back to life. All right, now that's uh, one picture that we see in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 13 through 20 or so. Uh, that's one beast uh, effort at empire. We would say it, this, this empire is more or less secular in nature. Now John sees a vision of a second beast coming up. This one not coming up out of the sea, which represents the uh, multitudes of people, but this is coming up out of the ground, which is normally symbolic of uh, the d domain of demonic, uh, demonic deception or demonic forces. And, uh, and this second beast, uh, we would say, is religious in nature. Uh, it it uh, looks like a lamb. It has the outward appearance of a lamb, the symbolism of a lamb, but it says it speaks with the voice of the dragon. I'm going to ask John to read uh, excerpts from 13 again, Revelation 13, that specifically describes this second beast. All right, we're going to read verses 11 and 12. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. So it looks like uh, religious, uh, Christianity, and he spoke as a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. So, so this, this beast... And again, when we say beast, we're talking about a, a global entity, a global empire type entity. This is religious in nature. It has to do with worship. Uh, it controls uh, all of mankind. It is pattern uh, or designed in the same pattern as the original beast. Uh, and it derives its authority from that beast. So it, it looks like it's acting independently, but it's actually acting under the authority of the of the first uh, what we would what normally is referred to as the antitype antichrist type government. Right now we read in the beginning of this we see that Satan gives this first beast his power, and the second beast looks like uh, religious but it uh, or, or righteous but it sounds like the dragon. So we would say that the second beast becomes or is a worldwide religious system. That, totally. that's, that's demonic in nature. It looks like uh, a worldwide religious system, like something good, but is demonic in nature because it is opposed to God and God's people right. and God's plan. In Revelation 19, it's referred to as the false prophet. Right. And so, and so again... It, so it's it, not a person there again. It's a beast. It's a system. We're looking at systems here. Now, there may be a man, the Antichrist, in charge of the secular beast, and some man in charge of the religious beast, but we don't have to look for the man. We have to really can look at uh, the beast as it's forming. Right. If we, if we to, to, to emphasize what you're saying, we, we can look at the uh, government of the United States at the present time. Uh, the head of the government of the United States is the president, Mr. Bush, but the, obviously the government of the United States is much more extensive than just the one person, but, but that individual is seen as the, as the head. So I, we believe that the Antichrist, uh, so-called Antichrist, uh, as the specific head, maybe one individual, but there's a much greater system that branches encompassing the whole world. And probably the same thing would exist in this religious beast also. Okay, so let's identify these beasts a little further then. We already have a secular government in the world, and we would call it the United Nations. 
Now, the United Nations has a structure uh, that, and the United Nations, in, in its present form, avoids the subject of religion. Mm -hmm. it's, the United Nations is <laughs> anti-everything, has never done anything, so if it's going to survive, if, but it is a prototype of what this beast government could be, uh, or will be, if the United Nations doesn't start exercising real authority, it will be replaced with the next phase, the next model, we might say, of this one world government that will start exercising authority. And then the, the, uh, we don't see as clearly the religious piece, though, Ken. That's true. Now, again, if we look at the, if we look at the UN, again, and I believe I agree, agree with John to say that the UN may just be a type or prototype of what's coming, perhaps some international emergency, uh, perhaps terrorism, who knows uh, what it might be, uh, climatic changes. Uh, we hear a lot about that today. Uh, everybody's very, very concerned about those things. There might be any number of international factors that would, that would uh, uh, cause nations to give up sovereignty to such an entity, uh, something that would evolve from the United Nations. In the guise of world peace sure. and a better Prosperity. ecology, sure. uh, global warming, cheap gas, a, a multitude of things. And, and, one, and some of the characteristics of, the, of, the, of this government at the present time that we can see is that it's, it's democratic in nature. Uh, it, it fosters a free market economy. It focuses on human rights. And as John pointed out, uh, separation of church and state, or religious uh, from uh, secular and religious affairs. So, if it separates secular and religious affairs, it needs a second beast uh, right. to handle that end of the thing, and that's what we believe uh, will eventually now, come into the existence. We would say it's much more; hard, it's harder to define because uh, simply it's not fu fully formed yet. We see uh, uh, slight gatherings of uh, world religious leaders, but it hasn't evolved yet, uh, but we could see the beginnings of it. Uh, and Ken, if, it, if the UN is a prototype, uh, maybe we could look at the uh, way the UN is structured yes. and then how the religious piece might be structured. Let, let's do that. We have, a, we have a diagram that illustrates the basic power structure uh, organizational structure of the United Nations is made up uh, the real power of the United Nations is centered in the Security Council which is made up of, of uh, five, I'll call them super uh, members because they have absolute vetoes uh, which really means that they have uh, the vast majority of power ten rotating I'll call junior members and then the will of the Security Council is exercised through the executive head, which is the secretary general, and then every member nation then uh, is a part of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, they, uh, member nations as such doesn't have really very much power. That power is reserved to the Security Council. So we believe that a religious system might be, be structured, structured similar in a very this. similar way. Right. And um, it would, if we look, think about it, it would be a a compilation of uh, or membership of the major world religions. Yeah. Uh, some junior religions uh, without any uh, uh, authority, really. But they would be apostate religions, uh, maybe apostate Christianity, apostate Islam, uh, even apostate Judaism, and uh, the other world religions uh, would join this to give up their uh, sovereignty of being elect. So, well, okay, so all the United Religions, uh, and, and these meetings occur, uh, efforts at forming such a United Religions thing has, I've read about, I read about every, every few years, so I'll see an article in yeah. a paper where these groups met, everybody is included, uh, every sect that you could imagine are involved, but there are some super members that would dominate the thing, and, and, uh, and I, I suspect that that, you know, representatives of uh, like the Roman Catholic Church, for example, which is obviously a huge religious organization, along with representatives of Shiites and Sunni Islam and so on, would have to constitute the super members uh, of this religious council. And, uh, 
and uh, smaller groups, smaller sects would be, let's say, a part of the General Assembly, maybe rotate like, like it does in the UN, rotating members on the Security Council, but, with, uh, but there are super members that would have the dominant power. And it would exercise great authority. Remember, it, it, and, and it tells the whole world to listen to the secular beast or to serve, Ken. When we say worship, that word in Hebrew of worship is really serve. Uh, or, or, and so it causes, uh, so world religious leaders, apostate religious leaders, encouraging the world to serve the secular one world government and uh, everyone who doesn't, uh, will becomes an enemy of this religious beast. <clears throat> now you you brought that up, John. Let's talk about that just for a minute. Let's that you know everybody concerns himself with the so-called mark of the beast. Right. And and this there, herein is is the position of the mark of the beast. A lot of people used to worry about tattoos on your hand and your forehead of some sort of number system, for example. That's as, too obvious, isn't as it? As little obvious. As technology has advanced, now we're worried about a chip of some sort uh, uh, that would identify you. Uh, but we believe the Bible uh, gives us a precedent for this, and we see it in, in the Torah, in the... In the uh, 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 observance uh, uh, of an Orthodox Jew, they have a small box, uh, tefillin, that they put on their forehead. It's a, it's a kind of, for a Christian, it's kind of a strange looking contraption, frankly. Uh, first time I saw it, I was like, where in the world did that well, come from? But in it, Matthew 23, it's called phylactery. All right, all right, well, that's a Greek. Right? But, right. but they strap a box to their hand and to their forehead, and that's where the mark of the beast comes, their forehead. And and so and so Satan is subtle, and we I'm, frankly I'm not particularly concerned about a chip or anything else in that sense. Uh, uh, I believe what that means. You know, often in the Hebrew scriptures there's a pattern that has a spiritual implication in the New Testament, and I believe that that means giving your mental assent uh, to the goals of the beast. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, agreeing that mankind must do something to save itself. And that the uh, putting this put it on your hand, the mark on your hand, rep, rep says that you're actually giving your energy and strength to that system. So, so I expect these world religious leaders uh, that are causing people to serve the beast that you've talked about are simply preaching uh, the the, the we must system. we must save ourselves. We must man must save himself and exhorting you to give your strength to it. If we think about what's in the box, Ken, there are scriptures in there from uh, Exodus 13 and also uh, uh, Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 11. That's uh, God is the only answer, and I'm going to work to see God's solution come true. Okay, that's... So Satan has perverted it then sure. to be... Uh, man has the solution to all our problems, and we're going to work for man's solution rather than God's solution. And man's solution is going nowhere but destruction. So I think this thing is much more subtle than uh, some tattoo or chip or anything like that. I think it's simple, given yep. mental assent and your strength. All right, let's, let's summarize, John, if we could, what we see the, uh, John actually describing uh, in this uh, Revelation okay, so 13. Now let's go back to the beast of Revelation 13. I hope we can get a little better picture and understand them a little better now. The secular beast is uh, fairly clear, uh, either the UN or something like the UN. The religious beast is not that clear, but I hope we've separated it to two uh, worldwide organizations that uh, uh, that God calls a beast. Okay, and, and again, focusing on this religious beast, it gives everybody a mark. Uh, you can't buy and sell with that. And so it, so the, the religious thing actually uh, uh, defines membership, and, and we believe that, again, that would include uh, forms of apostate religion, apostate of Christianity, most likely apostate uh, Islam, uh, there's a question about uh, apostate uh, uh, 
uh, Judaism. Uh, they it, would it, have no no voice. There's only 13 million Jews in the right. in the world. I I think they they would certainly not be a major member. What one of the things that one of the things that uh, causes me to think that Judaism would not be included is is if I look at uh, the situation that existed in Europe in Nazi, under uh, Nazi German rule. Uh, Jews were just simply marked and excluded. Right. They it didn't, didn't matter. If it didn't, ma or didn't matter if they were liberal or, or observant, or, observant uh, or anything right. else. They were. They were always. They were seen as enemies of the regime simply because they were Jewish. Right. And so, I, so, I suspect this one is going to do all the right. same. All right. And both in Daniel seven, and Revelation uh, thirteen, we see the beast though uh, making war with God's people and making war with the real lamb. And so sure. uh, there, uh, and so that, that characteristic is going to be there. If you are part of an apostate religion, you probably have no problem. If you are believe that you're called by God and, the, and you believe in the scriptures, or what we're saying today, uh, this beast is going, you're going to be an enemy. Of the he, he's going to come for you. One, uh, you know, uh, I keep referring to the situation in Europe and the Holocaust. Uh, several years ago, my wife and I uh, were in Europe, and we uh, visited the camp at Dachau. Uh, and um, and I, I was expecting to see the uh, you know the uh, uh, yellow stars of David that Jews were forced to wear to identify them. And there, there's a museum there, and we went through it, and so sure enough, there it was. Uh, what what caught me by surprise a little bit was that that there was a different type of patch uh, for evangelical preachers, and but from the from the standpoint of the Nazi government, they were treated exactly the same as the anyone bearing the Jewish star. And so and so, had we been doing? You're Jewish. I'm not. But had I been doing in Europe what we're doing here, I would be considered Jewish. And so, and so, real Bible believers, spirit-filled Christians that's looking for God and for the Messiah to come uh, are going to be uh, enemies of this regime. Okay, Ken, do you have a prophecy book? That, yeah, uh, let, let me let me hawk this just a minute, John. It's a workbook that I've written for our classes at the Zamok Institute called Bible Prophecy. Write in and pick up a copy of that, and, and we'll treat these subjects. And also, John, I'll flip it back to you. I know you're taking a group up the land. And that's a very good way yeah, to deal with it. We're going up. That's right. We're going to meet these people on the hills of Judea and Samaria. We're going up for uh, almost two weeks. In March of 2009, call in, I'll send you a brochure. Well, that's our program for this evening. Shalom. Sorry.